to understand that Bartimaeus is the only person recorded in Luke's gospel who uses this title. Notice he doesn't cry out, Jesus of Nazareth, have mercy on me. No, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He's making a statement of faith, by the way. I know you're not just Jesus from Nazareth. That's geography. I know that you're the son of David. That's deity. Physical sight does not guarantee spiritual insight. Physical blindness doesn't limit spiritual vision. Jesus demonstrated perhaps the ultimate messianic power when he restored sight to a believing blind man. But many people in the crowd had perfectly good vision and couldn't see their Savior standing right in front of them. We need to make sure we never make that same mistake. Welcome to Wisdom for the Heart. Today, Stephen brings you a message on the healing of Bartimaeus in this message called The Cure for Spiritual Blindness. The World Health Organization reported that as of last year, there are 19 million children in the world who are either completely blind or visually impaired. Imagine 19 million children cannot see well or at all. There are uh, now 7.3 million visually impaired or completely blind people in the United States. The rabbis of Jesus' day were teaching that only God could cure blindness. In fact, you you might be aware of this, but we have no instance in the Old Testament, not even one, of someone being cured of blindness. It's as if God withheld that one miracle, that one unique authenticating miracle to identify Jesus as the Messiah. In fact, when Jesus preached his first sermon He unrolled the scroll of Isaiah to that signature passage in Isaiah chapter 61, as we know it, and he read that messianic prophecy. Here's what he said. Here's what Jesus read. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind. We're about to watch... Jesus, do just that. So would you turn again to Luke chapter 18? Luke chapter 18, and I'll tell you ahead of time as you're turning that we're about to watch the disciples refuse to believe something they did not want to see. And we're going to watch a, a blind man believe even though he can't see. Now, if you're new to us, We're going through this gospel. We're now in chapter 18, where we left off at verse 31. Jesus taking the 12, that's the original 12, those who will become apostles, minus Judas, of course, who will refuse to believe. He said to them, see, note that, look, I want you to see this. We are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man By the prophets will be accomplished. Jesus often referred to himself with a third person pronoun as if he's talking about somebody else referring to himself. The son of man, by the way, is a messianic title taken right from Daniel's prophecy. Now, what do the Old Testament prophets prophesy that Jesus is saying he's going to fulfill? Verse 32. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles and will be mocked And shamefully treated and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him. And on the third day he will rise. But they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them. And they did not grasp what was said. The disciples, beloved, are completely missing the vision Jesus is describing. They don't see it. 
I think of Helen Keller, whom I've mentioned before. She made this statement in her later years, and it introduces the issue we're, we're watching here in this scene. Helen Keller wrote, The only thing worse than being blind is having sight but no vision. That's the disciples at this moment. In fact, you might have noticed Luke said three different ways they didn't see it. Verse 34 again. But they understood none of these things, one. This saying was hidden from them, two. And they did not grasp what was said, three. Three ways of telling us they didn't get it. You probably didn't appreciate Luke recording this for all of church history to to read. They just didn't see it. Now, to be fair to them, there are two dimensions at work here that produce, as it were, this lack of insight. First, there is a spiritual dimension to their lack of of insight. We're told here in this prophecy uh, from Christ that this was hidden to them. The original language informs us that a sense of blindness was imposed upon them. So they didn't, they didn't fully understand what he meant. And we can understand why. By the way, this is the grace of God at work. If he, if he told us what was going to happen next week, we might not want to get out of bed. Next month, next year, for the rest of your life, he withholds it until you reach the corner at different points in life. He's doing that here. Had they, had they fully understood what Jesus was saying, it, it occurs to me, uh, they, they could have immediately you know, seized weapons, put on swords, galvanized this multitude of people following Jesus into a, a lay army and, and rushed into Jerusalem to seize the throne. They're not going to seize him. They're not going to kill him. Or, think about it, they... Could have become so discouraged that they, they quit. Why bother? Why go to Jerusalem? We're done. You just said you're going to die. They never caught his promise to rise again. There is a spiritual dimension in their lack of insight. Secondly, there's an emotional dimension to their lack of insight. They're not seeing this because they don't want to see it. They're not hearing Jesus because they... They don't want to hear what Jesus is saying. We all have a way of seeing what we want to see. Of hearing what we want to hear. Now at this moment, the crowd is warming up their hosannas. In a few days, they're going to march in with Jesus. And and they're going to be surrounding him, waving palm branches as he arrives in that triumphal entry just a few days away. They're, they're, They're ready to begin chanting. You know, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. The king is here. So what do you mean you're going to be flogged and shamed and spit upon? The kingdom is around the corner. The vision Jesus has is that in a matter of days, he's going to fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah who wrote in chapter fifty. Jesus is actually quoting that here. He's paraphrasing it. Isaiah writes of the Messiah, I did not turn away. I gave my back to those who strike me and my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from scorn and spit. This is what Jesus sees. So in a very real sense, the disciples had sight but no spiritual vision. We're about to be introduced to a man who didn't have sight, but had spiritual vision. Now notice verse 35. As he drew near Jesus and this crowd, drew near to Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. Now at this point, I know we want to get right to it, but I've got to stop. I've got to deal with this because the liberals and the skeptics love this verse. Right here, they've spilled a lot of ink on it. They're going to typically tell first semester college freshmen that here's one of the clues that the Bible is obviously wrong because Luke just said that Jesus was drawing near to Jericho. Matthew writes that Jesus was leaving Jericho. Matthew says there were two blind men and Mark's gospel and Luke's gospel only talk about one 
blind man. So the Gospels are evidently filled with error. Well, let me spend spend just a minute or two. The the answer is in a little bit of history. The old city of Jericho, the ruins still standing, people to some degree still living there, had been destroyed uh, back in um, Joshua chapter 6. We're still singing about it today when the walls came what? Tumbling down. The Israelites captured it, never completely rebuilt it. Just a mile away was new Jericho, just down the road, the city of, we could call it New Jericho, had been built by Herod the Great. This was a city for the royals, the wealthy. They built enormous palaces, uh, swimming pools, covered in marble, bathhouses, gardens, theaters for dramas, outdoors. New Jericho was a favorite vacation retreat for wealthy people, and Jewish people would travel through both of these, the old Jericho and a mile later, the new Jericho on their way to Jerusalem. All that to say, Jesus is evidently leaving the old city of Jericho and arriving at the new city of Jericho. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are all correct. By the way, neither Mark nor Luke say there was only one blind man. They just focus on one of them, more than likely because he would become known to the early church and Mark gives us his name, Bartimaeus. So we'll focus our attention on just him as well. Well, here's Bartimaeus. He's sitting on the outskirts of of Jericho, New Jericho. Jewish people are flooding through with, with money in their pockets to shop and to go to their favorite restaurants. This is a great place to beg. And even though it was the best season for begging, as literally hundreds of thousands of Jewish people are on their pilgrimage to go to Jerusalem for Passover, you have to understand how hopeless he is. He's not going. There's no treatment for him. There's no surgical option for him. There's no medicine. He... He, furthermore, would have been viewed as somebody under the judgment of God. He's done something wrong. God's judged him. God is paying him back. Groups of people that have been traveling to Jerusalem have already passed by Bartimaeus. But now he hears this this crowd coming. And it's a large crowd. The word Luke uses could be rendered multitude, used earlier for thousands of people. People. This is this is just a little band of travelers huddled together. They're they're stepping around Bartimaeus so they won't step on him. And he wonders what in the world is going on now. And he asks, verse 36, and hearing the crowd going by, he inquired what this meant. And they told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy. On me. Notice he doesn't cry out, Jesus of Nazareth, have mercy on me. No, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He's making a statement of faith, by the way. I know you're not just Jesus from Nazareth. That's that's geography. I know that you're the son of David. That's deity. The Messiah, the anointed, the Christos. You need to understand that Bartimaeus is the only person recorded in Luke's gospel who uses this title, this assertion that Jesus is none other than the Messiah. (laughs) Now the rabbis... You know, they're already using Son of David as a messianic title. They, they took it from Isaiah chapter 11. They even taught that the Messiah would come as the, they called him the second David. In fact, sometimes they would even refer to the Messiah as David. Simply David. A devout Jew every single day had lines memorized where he was praying that God would send the Messiah from the house of David. Now, we don't, we don't know when it happened. We don't know where it happened, but somewhere along the line, he's heard the stories of passerbys. This probably isn't his first 
season of begging during Passover. He's, he's connected the dots. And the reason he's crying out here is that he believes what the rabbis have been teaching, that, that only God can cure blindness. Hey! He calls out. Even though he has a lot to learn, he believes Jesus can give him sight. He is the divine Messiah, even though Bartimaeus can't see. Listen, he does see. Even though his world is dark, he recognizes the light. Notice the crowd, verse 39, getting this just like the world. And those who were in front rebuked him, telling him to be silent, be quiet. He doesn't have time for you. You don't matter, beggar. If Jesus is the Messiah, he's, he's not going to have time for the likes of you. And Luke writes here in verse 39, they rebuked him, telling him to be silent. I like this guy. He cried out all the more. Son of David, have mercy on me. He's going to pipe down. He's crying louder. He's desperate. His only hope is about to walk by. Have you ever watched a, a movie where a guy is stranded on a deserted island and a helicopter starts flying overhead and he starts waving his arms and screaming and, and running and yelling and, and you're sitting there, you, you can hardly breathe. Are they gonna are they gonna see him? Are they gonna spot him? Are they gonna are they gonna rescue him? Are they gonna stop? Are they gonna stop? The very next phrase delivers those incredible words, notice, and Jesus stopped. He heard. He knew. He cared. Look, in a few days, Jesus is going to hang on a cross. But he cared about this beggar. Verse 40, and Jesus stopped and commanded him to be brought to him. And everybody comes to a screeching halt. And when he came near, he, Jesus, asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Well, Jesus knew what Bartimaeus wanted him to do. He's tapping his way over to Jesus. Pretty obvious. Jesus isn't confused. But Jesus wants to make sure this crowd doesn't miss this messianic, authenticating miracle. There can be no mistake here. Bartimaeus, what do you want? You want money? You want, you want some new clothing? You want some food? What, what, what do you want? Verse 41, what do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, let me recover my sight. And I think he's probably yelling. I want to see. Don't miss that. Lord, we've gone from Jesus of Nazareth to the son of David to Lord. I want to recover my sight. The word for recover, by the way, could refer to somebody Losing their sight sometime during their lifetime or someone who was born blind at birth. They, they want to receive their sight. That's how Jesus actually used this same word here. The blind will receive their sight. Lord, I want to be able to see. Verse 42, and Jesus said to him, recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. You were blind but the eyes of your heart saw who I was, the son of David, the Messiah, the Lord. You placed your faith in me and my power alone. Your faith has sozo. Your faith has saved you. The next verse says, and immediately he recovered his sight and followed him, glorifying God and all the people when they saw it gave 
Okay, praise to God. Underscore that, that word in your mind immediately. Now think about it. Immediately. I mean, just like that. No surgery. No, no rehabilitation. No exercises for muscle memory. No therapy for eye coordination. Uh, none of that. Immediately, 274 million rods and cones begin converting light into chemical impulses. Immediately, those impulses travel through the optic nerve to the brain at the rate of 1 billion messages per second. Bartimaeus sees. He sees. And the hundreds of elements of that miracle are staggering. More importantly, Bartimaeus becomes new believer Bartimaeus. Brother Bartimaeus. For most of this crowd, they will remain spiritually blind. In fact, in a few days, many of them will be crying out, not Hosanna, but crucify him. What's the cure for spiritual blindness? Well, let me boil it down to a three-step cure based on this text. First, like Bartimaeus, you need to understand that without Christ, you are spiritually blind. You say, well... How hard can that be for somebody to admit that? Well, have you talked to people lately? I've talked to many people who have no idea that they can't see spiritually. As far as they're concerned, they've got great insight into religion and God and eternity and truth. And none of it matches the record of scripture. How about you? Do you know that you're blind in your sin today apart from Christ? Have you ever come to that realization That's the first step. Understand that you're spiritually blind. Secondly, you need to believe that there's only one saving cure. That that Christ alone is able to save you. To open your eyes to see the truth of the gospel and the glory of his, his nature, his deity. And again, I've talked to a lot of people over the years and they, it's like they've got a little spiritual backpack on their back and there's stuff and everything in there. they got something hanging from their windshield to catch the bad dreams. They've got this little ritual. They've got this discipline. They pray a little prayer, light a candle, come to church. They're, they're just stuffing in there because they want to make sure they've got all the options. Jesus is not going to save you until Jesus becomes your only option. You need to understand that you're spiritually blind. You need to believe there's only one saving cure. Thirdly, you need to make one sincere request. Like Bartimaeus here. He cries out in repentance and faith and desperation and dependency. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. I've got nothing to offer you. I'm a, I'm a blind beggar. When you come to Jesus like that, nothing to offer you, not going to impress you. I have nothing but rags. Then he will immediately save you. He will open your spiritual eyes that the apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians. We're blinded so that they could not see the light of the glory of the gospel of Christ, who is the image of of God. So what do you see when you look at Jesus today? You might be physically blind, but you can see the truth of Christ. You might have 2020 vision and be blind to the spiritual reality of Christ. Now, earlier I mentioned Helen Keller who was blind, also mute and deaf. I've mentioned before to our congregation and even earlier this morning about her insight in saying she'd rather be blind than have sight without vision. That had profound spiritual implications as well. And she was a believer. She came to Christ thanks to her Christian tutor, Ann Sullivan, who taught her how to connect and communicate at the age of seven and then would braille and, and hand uh, uh, signals pressed into her palm. She began to communicate, became an insatiable learner. If you've ever read her biography, she'd grow up to become a a brilliant uh, individual, a renowned uh, speaker, awarded a number of honorary doctorates. 
Later in life, she was awarded the Presidential Medal of, of Freedom. Well, at the age of eight, she came to understand her spiritual need and brought a pastor along to deliver the gospel now that she could understand. And Helen responded in faith, and she would later say this, I always knew there was a God, but now I know his name. See, she had more vision as a blind girl than our world has today. Like Bartimaeus, he had more insight in his blindness than many people in this crowd. Bible scholars, by the way, piece together historical evidences that reveal Bartimaeus did follow Jesus uh, from Jericho. And from what we know, he never left Jerusalem. He followed Jesus into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. He was among those who huddled in tears at the death of Christ. He was there with hundreds of believers who were celebrating the resurrection of Christ. A month and a few weeks later, he was there on the day of Pentecost when the church was created. He was among the 3,000 who would be baptized by the apostles. He would become known in the early church as a faithful follower of Christ. He never got over it. But even here on this dusty road, beloved, he's way ahead of the crowd. He knew that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah, was the King, was the Lord. And again, I want to ask you, who is Jesus to you? Today, Have you asked him to cure you of spiritual blindness as you choose by faith to trust him alone as your, your Messiah, as your King, as your Lord? The message you just heard is called The Cure for Spiritual Blindness. It comes from Stephen's teaching series through this portion of Luke called Parables and Prophecies. This is Wisdom for the Heart. Wisdom for the Heart is produced by Wisdom International. Our desire is to produce and distribute biblically faithful resources that will help you walk wisely through life. I hope you're finding that to be true. We're so thankful for this radio station that makes it possible for you to hear Wisdom for the Heart. We also have a website that you'll find at wisdomonline.org. Please join us again next time for more Wisdom for the Heart. Wisdom for the Heart.